Good morning, Professor S. S. Mantha, sir, Honorable Chairman, All India Council for Technical Education, and today's esteemed keynote speaker, Professor Suhen Sabir, sir, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, participants of the program, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, we welcome all to the third lecture of the USTEM lecture series organized to discuss various aspects issues and challenges in higher education during and post COVID-19. Before we begin, I would like to request all the participants to kindly mute their audio during the sessions. Participants can post their queries in the chat box. Selected queries will be taken up for the uh, discussion, taking into account the time factor. We will also request uh, the participants to kindly fill up the feedback form. The link of the feedback form will be shared uh, during and at the end of the session. The certificate will be issued only to those participants who have submitted the feedback form. You can submit the feedback form by midnight today. I would now like to request uh, Professor Suhail Savisar, Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, US team, to kindly present the vote of thanks, sir. Thank you. We all know the challenges are enormous, and uh, uh, we understand that uh, academicians know it better than anybody else that uh, how we can cope up with the situation as it emerges. And uh, we just don't know that how long it will continue and when we'll be able to say post COVID. Uh, right now it is during the COVID-19, uh, we are facing a number of challenges. And uh, being a wonderful administrator, uh, being chair, former chairman of ACB, uh, I'm sure that uh, your words of wisdom will uh, be definitely a uh, guiding principle uh, for all of us to, I should say, a very unprecedented situation uh, which is emerging day by day. So without taking much time, I would like to request you to please uh, uh, give your talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today we, we have with us Professor S.S. Mantha, sir. Uh, Professor S.S. Mantha, sir, an alumni of uh, VJTI Mumbai. He was also the professor and HOD of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at VJTI. He also served as the Pro Vice Chancellor of SNDT Women's College. In, 19, uh, in 2009, he was appointed as the chairman of AICTE. And during his tenure, he has brought many changes in the AICT. He has implemented the e-governance driven approval process, which reduced the discrepancy power of the local administration and has also brought in more transparency and ease. Uh, Professor Manthasar has also successfully initiated the CMAT exam, actually, which has become the largest MBA exam in the country after CAT. He is also associated, as we all know, uh, he is the advisor of many national and international organizations of repute. And we are indeed honored that we have today with us Professor Mantha, sir. Sir, I would now like to hand over the session to you. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sohel, uh, Professor Mahajabin, and uh, all the other uh, invited uh, guests and all the participants. Uh, first of all, good morning to you all. Uh, the uh, discussion on challenges in higher education during and post COVID-19 assumes a great uh, significance in the because of the times that we are living in and the challenges that we are yet to see. There are a lot of challenges we've already uh, been uh, uh, looking at in future probably we will have even more uh, uh, challenges to uh, uh, you know, counter with. Now having said all that, uh, we will, I, what I'll do is I'll go through a presentation for you, uh, which uh, captures some of the uh, problem areas and possible solutions in the coming times to, uh, in, in the times to come. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, for a start, <clears throat> this pandemic will, will change the course of our living, like all pandemics do. And we must be innovative to overcome that. Engineering, we all know science, 
and therefore everything cannot be virtual though we are seeing a lot of uh, content being available online and students and faculty making use of that content in very good uh, measure and very good effect in future too we will require the online support and that why we do we need that online support in future as well we will see some of in some of the uh, slides that i have in addition to engineering and technology being an applied science we also must see at other facets of higher education they do need hybrid or blended learning more than online learning and in some of the slides we will also see what is this hybrid learning what is blended learning and so on and how they are here to influence the course of education in future so there are several facets of higher education which will need some kind of mix between face to face learning and online learning and which mix a traditional institutional attendance with laboratory and home instruction a lot of study will have to be done from home in terms of assignments in terms of home instructions and so on and they will add value to the instructional design that one tends to have now that being the preamble we need a higher educate we need a higher system in future which can assimilate the changing design of uh, technology the changing technology and also the pressures that are there on the delivery of education both in schools as well as higher education systems currently we have a robust higher education system with almost 1000 universities 45000 colleges they have stood the time time of test though we all know that higher education system has never reached everyone for various reasons again financial being the most uh, prime and other reasons like supporting the family or not being interested in the current delivery of higher education the ger consequently is only 25 which actually means 75 people out of every 100 or 75 students of every 100 that we have can go to colleges but have not gone to colleges now which means any higher education system as far as catering to those who in the colleges must also look at the people outside the college and the future and this uh, covid driven uh, Uh, be uh, be accounted for uh, when is looked at. Now, even that twenty-five GER where students are within the colleges and and so on, even that is disrupted like never before. And since mid March this year. some of the colleges were held till mid march and a lot of disruption has happened subsequently the students have been asked to vacate hostels one back and everyone is trying to complete education paradigm which has been so uh, disrupted so in that process we have two problems to contend with one 
is an immediate problem and the other one is a long term one let's see what these problems are the, in the immediate we need to complete the unfinished curriculum and in fact some of the uh, institutions and universities have taken a course to a lot of online content and have completed the unfinished curriculum that was left in mid march by that time most of the institutions and universities have completed at least 60 to 70 percent of the curriculum now what should have people uh, done in those circumstances the best option is to aggregate all good online content from various most platforms we'll come to all that in uh, some of the slides there are a lot of MOOCs uh, like online platforms available in the public domain in the private domain and they the content that is available on these platforms must be aggregated and that must be used to complete the coursework which has been left unfinished there are several machine learning algorithms and ai based algorithms which actually goes through a lot of content that is available whether it's a uh, private player like coursera or today or edx and so on and allotting to the may have the modules that are available online they are short modules about 10 to 15 minutes each of them and therefore they are unit based and curriculum typically three credits goes for five six hours you need several of these 15 minute modules put them we have some hand holding by the faculty within the institution or within the university, which enables this uh, and uh, the alignment and, and things like that. Like I said, there are several tools available to do the actual aligning must be used. And in fact, most of the learning management platforms, they allow these kind of uh, alignments. The faculty must handhold like and, in, and align the online content to the remaining curriculum. And they use, uh, like I said, machine learning algorithms to handle them. Now they must be integrated with learning management platforms. Moodle is an open source. Canvas, Blackboard, or, or these are not open source, uh, but, but some of the best uh, on uh, learning management systems available today in the world or something similar there are several of them great learning is another uh, learning management system uh, talent ms is another one so one needs to make an assessment of which learning management system to use and align them to the erp that is currently running within the university and uh, these also have capabilities to create student and faculty data analytics like, for example, finding out how many students have attended classes, how many, for how much time they have attended, what kind of questions they have, what kind of feedback they have given, and analyzing all that is a part of the learning management, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, learning management platform. And this helps in personalized learning, which is an important part of online learning. Now, we need to understand a little bit of what this personalized learning is, is about. Every student has a certain need, certain capabilities, certain level of understanding, and so on. So therefore, the content and the delivery and the protocol used must be typically aligned to every individual so that they can learn the uh content based now, personalized learning also has one other facet no long future people will be interested in typical 
programs that we have like a, like a BA, a BSc, a BCom or a BTEC or whatever. So that in future people will start looking at the content that is available and build different courses together for themselves as they understand, as they look at and create courses out of content that's 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 uh, that they feel uh, would bring value to them so therefore there will be customer based or customer designed degrees customer designed diplomas and so on in future so personalized learning has several facets which we need to understand and some of the slides that i have will also bring, bring that out succinctly now uh, what about the, uh, in case in the immediate, we have completed the curriculum, there is also need for assessment and we need to really look at what the, how, how do we do the assessment? I mean, there must be a, uh, a view out of the ordinary thinking or, or like out of box thinking that we normally talk about. And we need to explore all those possibilities in the current uh, times. For example, national accreditation agencies such as NAC and NBA, they stress a great deal on continuous assessment to evaluate student outcomes. And we also know that accreditation is mandatory. Now what that means is every institution must have gone through a continuous assessment where certain quizzes, certain uh, tests and uh, unit-based uh, unit tests, all these uh, are a part of uh, the assessment system. Now, when we have these systems in place, continuous assessments must be credited appropriately. And based on maybe the previous two semesters, the, a template can be created, which would <coughs> act as instead of paper-based, examinations. Paper-based examinations is just not workable in the coming in the current scenario and therefore we need to look at alternatives and continuous assessments and the assess and the uh, assessments done in previous semesters must come in handy at this point of time. As an alternative one can also have an objective type and online examination that's generated from AI-based question generators. You have several applications like Quillions, which actually allow you to create different question papers based on keywords that you write on. And the randomly distributed to the student community can take care of the final year students. So you create an objective-based test where the assessments can be simple and the results can be declared almost instantaneously. So every uh, difficult situation will require a solution which may not be uh, simple, but all the same, we need to uh, look at uh, making them happen. Now, everything from student learning assessment to entry level candidate assessment are done online. Now, the, the most of the uh, platforms, the learning management systems, they allow you to do this. And we have smart classrooms, we have talked about, we have, we have seen smart classrooms already op operational in many universities. And many universities also have some kind of LMS, which is most of the time the open source model. It's now easier for teachers to conduct interactive learning sessions, map students' knowledge, how much does a student know, how much does he need to know in order to make the grade. And they also create progress reports. A lot of student uh, data analytics is available, and therefore online examinations are conducted on web-enabled devices, like laptops, desktop computers, even on your mobile. So these are certain things that uh, people must uh, log on to in order to make the best of the current situation. As far as question paper formation, 
is concerned online exams, multilingual support, page navigation, time management, work management, booking systems, like where you need to book a slot to appear for a certain examination, and for some SMS has to be sent, some email alert has to be sent. We all tickets have to be generated, gateway support, result processing features, so grading, you know? instant score generation. These are all possible through any management systems. And therefore, uh, a university must move into this domain in times to come. Now, having said all this, the, several people ask questions like, what about the authenticity? Who gives the exam? Can we uh, check the student? And uh, I mean, uh, is the real student giving the examination and things like that? Now, my personal opinion is proving, and, and the technology bears me out, proving authenticity should not be a problem. Where a webcam initially picks up the profile, students appearing for the exam are verified using biometrics based authentication features. There are many, many biometric features which are already available within these uh, uh, commercial uh, platforms that are available for conducting examinations, online exams. And they use fingerprint, face recognition, palm print, hand geometry, iris recognition, and retina. They also add more proctoring. This is extremely important, remote proctoring during the sessions. So even assigning staff members for invigilation may be dispensed with because of the kind of automation that is happening. Now, we have seen some requirements in the short term in order to complete the curriculum, in order to conduct the exams, and so on. Let's see something in the long term. In the long term, however, consciously, the institutions and the universities must implement blended learning, where I said we'll, we'll talk about blended learning. There are several models available and so on. Or uh, so in some, uh, some of the parlance, they also use hybrid learning for this which is basically part, uh, you have partly face-to-face -face and partly online learning. Now, all the courses must be credited when done online or offline. There's nothing like an online credit is inferior to a face-to-face uh, -face credit and so on. This is something that the universities, the institutions must get uh, into their system before uh, this sinks in. There can be a debate on the percentage like uh, whether 30% should be online or 40% should be online and so on. That debate can go on, but in future, this is probably the new norm that will set in. Uh, uh, I thought 70-30 could be a good uh, start uh, to make 30% uh, of online content and 70 face-to-face, -face. at least in the applied sciences uh, uh, arena. And rest of the places, probably this percentage could uh, go up. Continuous assessment, pro appropriately credited uh, courses must eventually replace the year end, semester end examinations. In, in long time, if you really see the whole paradigm, conduct of uh, uh, an exit uh, exam, like the year end exam or semester end exam, must become redundant uh, and must be, must take, must be taken over by complete online assessment. And that is how the uh, online paradigms work. Now, when I said blended learning, there are, there are several, uh, again, blended, the understanding of that and so on. Very simply put, what it means is part of the learning is uh, done within the classroom and part of the learning is done outside the classroom. Now, how do you mix the two? Sometimes, from the student perspective, sometimes from the faculty perspective, uh, we'll give you several models of blended learning. So therefore you have four models of blended learning available. One is the rotation model, the flex model, a la carte and enriched virtual. Now these are the common blended learning models used wherever they are, wherever blended learning is a part of the curriculum. The rotation model again has four sub models, station rotation, lab rotation, flipped classroom rotation, and individual rotation. Now, as the, as the terminology suggests, they also mean something similar. Now, 
very briefly, the rotation uh, mod, uh, like for example, you have you have certain courses which need to be done uh, within the classroom, and certain courses which uh, cannot be done within or which can be done online, and and so on. So, what percentage happens, and when does the student get the uh, opportunity to decide or when the faculty decides for him and when does the uh, what happens within the classroom goes outside the classroom and what happens outside the classroom in terms of learning comes back into the classroom these kind of uh, decisions are made uh, through uh, the uh, analytic uh, that comes out of uh, uh, learning management uh, systems which people use so the different models actually uh, work on this. For example, in an a la carte model, uh, for example, a computer science student uh, takes entire online, entirely online, to accompany other experiences that the student is having at a brick and mortar school or learning center. Uh, you know, uh, so the teacher becomes the online teacher. There must be hand holding in, uh, in terms of online learning. Uh, so the faculty now becomes more teacher to a uh, to a mentor and that that transition may be difficult but that's what must happen in uh, future time so this uh, uh, these uh, things also have a, an experiential learning component as an enriched virtual models and they use the concept of uh, the labs and so on the IITs have a project running on virtual labs. Therefore, several simulations are also uh, done uh, in a virtual uh, lab uh, application. And students can learn on that, come back to a lab, and do the uh, actual uh, you know, hands-on uh, skill building. Now, having said all that, why do we really need blended learning and, and so on? First of all, the uh, current uh, situation, the current uh, pandemic has left us no choice except to learn and keep the learning going uh, through the online uh, process. Now, having said that, hybrid blended learning, hybrid or blend, blended learning is, is also interesting for two reasons. They blur the lines around what we consider a college and the other making it much easier for families to get high quality material and instructions for the children in a wide range of subjects. Now, these are the two very, very interesting points. Now, I said the GER is about 25, and there are 75 out of every 100 sitting outside who cannot go to college for several reasons. And they look at difference as someone who's going to the college and someone who's not able to go to a college. And the online learning precisely breaks that barrier and the second is uh, there is a lot of uh, good online content available in fact uh, uh, content is the heart of any online uh, learning uh, system and therefore we need good online content and we talk about online good online content we need transparent efficient effective responsive agile innovative and focused decision making is needed now these are all, uh, some of these are supported by technology that is available. Some of them are uh, factors which have to be looked at uh, in terms of uh, the development cycle. Now, having said that, a lot of digital content is available, like I said, and uh, a digit, good digital content uh, must be interactive, must be characteristic, must have a value of itself must be correct in that sense. It must be mobile based. Any con for example, the people are creating video content, you know, pushing it to the mobile applications and so on. Uh, so it must be realistic in the sense that there are several Oculus devices available, which are AR, VR, away of augmented reality, virtual reality based. And they give you the experiential uh, component uh, into learning and there also must be an emotional connect with what you're learning and how you're learning and when you're learning and, and things like that. So these are all the changes of digital contents that we must really look at. 
Now, successful digital learning has, uh, it goes through several devices. So access must be there uh, through all those uh, devices. And they generate, since we are talking about student data analytics and finding on trying and finding how each student behaves and what kind of learning a student requires, whether he's a slow learner, whether he's a fast learner, how do we, uh, you know, uh, give those uh, learning uh, uh, modules to each uh, student to suit his uh, pace and, and so on. Now, all this will result in a large data and you need big data management and learning analytics to take care of that. Uh, obviously, blending uh, online and offline is required. Uh, sometimes it's also uh, blended learning is also looked at as we, even within a classroom, you blend your face-to-face uh, -face teaching with additional content, <coughs> additional online content and so on. Now, there are various uh, digital content sharing and collaboration platforms available. We'll come to that. Training for teacher competence development is extremely important. Not everybody is trained in this sacrifice. So therefore, a lot of uh, training will be required. Now, service quality assurance is extremely important. In uh, times to times which have gone, we have only seen uh, open loop of uh, uh, quality control or accreditation. In the early days when accreditation started, we all uh, know that uh, several inputs were required. And uh, if an institution assures that they have provided all those inputs, then it was assumed that a certain amount, certain kind of quality was assured. As, they, as uh, we progressed, we are now talking about the closed uh, loop control uh, system, which means that we write program outcomes, we write course outcomes, and then we go and try and measure them objectively and see if uh, people are meeting those course and uh, program outcomes. And if there are deficiencies, uh, then we inform the uh, you know, people to correct uh, uh, them. Now, that's not a typical closed uh, loop circuit. What must happen is having measured those, uh, uh, those deficiencies, they must be quantified and uh, those errors must be actually added to the uh, next cycle of accreditation and uh, over a period of time in two three iterations you get probably a stable system now that's what is currently in progress but in time to come we will be looking at adaptive systems where each component of an accreditation uh, supply chain like for example the students the faculty the uh, the infrastructure the society the entrepreneur the industry and things like that each one of them has certain in input and certain output. And an adaptive system basically doesn't look at the entire cycle, but looks at each component and looks at whether each component is capable of delivering what it is supposed to deliver. Now, uh, having said that, uh, the world has already moved into what are quality assurance uh, systems. A an assurance actually talks about uh, uh, guaranteeing. Uh, and therefore, what it, uh, by definition, what it means is if you guarantee and don't deliver, then you can be sued. So uh, there, are, there are several cases which have happened in U.S. in the last uh, two months' uh, time. In fact, in uh, South Carolina, there are five universities which have, uh, uh, the students have sued the universities because they said that the content that is given to them is online, whereas they were promised face-to-face -face, uh, learning and they were also charging the universities that uh, the online degree uh, may not be as good as an uh, as a face-to-face -face, uh, degree so uh, what one needs to really do in order to answer that kind of questions is provide a methodology for quality assurance now there are several open online courses that are available for example uh, platforms that are available XMOOC, CMOOC, DOCC, books and MOOCs and things like that. Now, most common type of MOOCs organized around the central professor and the core curriculum is XMOOCs. And CMOOC uh, provides a connectivity. It resembles graduate seminars, assignments, and student discussions, and so on. DOCC is basically a distributed online collaborative course in which the same course material is distributed to students at multiple institutions but the exact administrators of the material can vary. Now, books is a big uh, 
open online course or similar to MOOCs, but the student population is limited to 50. SMOOC is uh, synchronous massive online courses where the lectures are broadcast live requiring students to log in at specific times in order to hear the lectures. SPOC is a small private online course similar to but the students teacher interaction are more closely modeled after classroom in interactions. So these are typically flipped classroom model. NOOCs is nano open online courses. Most of the content uh, providers today, they use no, uh, NOOCs or nano open online courses uh, broken into very small uh, units of maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, maximum of 12 minutes and so on. This, this is required because uh, uh, this is an asynchronous uh, mode of learning and there is no way I'm sure that the, uh, that the student uh, he is actually hooked onto the system and he is actually learning something. There's no way of telling that. So therefore, the, in order to retain the attention, the modules will have to be uh, very, very uh, short and uh, uh, explained uh, in a manner that the attention is not lost in, at any point of time. So having spoken about all that, we look at what is this learning management system that we are talking about. Now, learning is the core of delivering any educational or training program by an individual. Management is a stem of learning program, which manages all the sh schedules for each and every individual. There are students, there are faculty, there are different timetables. Some student may learn some course now, some other student may learn some other course. And so therefore, several possibilities are here. Then uh, you'll have to assign faculty to each one of them for handholding. And, and therefore, there is a lot of administration that is uh, required to make this happen. So um, we need a management uh, part of it, which is all done again at the back end. Uh, system is an e-platform to e-learning. So therefore, you have learning management system. And LMS is uh, actually designed to help an individual to develop, manage, and provide online courses or programs to learn. So this process is also done through uh, another uh, uh, process called gamification. The entire learning is, is, is taught uh, along with videos and like, like it, uh, it's le learned like you learn and you play a game. Now here I have a slide which actually more uses MOOCs as an activator. In the network, MOOCs becomes the important part in future times. Whether it's hybrid or online, whatever form you may really have. So therefore, when you're using MOOCs as a regulator, you can connect actually multiple universities. It's not necessary that one MOOCs aggregator, one university, and you have, uh, you know, every university replicating the whole thing. Now that may not really be necessary, whether it will function in practice, whether it will uh, take shape in practice is a different uh, question. But in real terms, you can have one single MOOCs aggregator and you can have multiple universities. You, on one side, you have regulator professional bodies who set the rules and, and so on. On the other side, you have advertisers and sponsors and because uh, you have a hand-holding element who is a teacher and therefore that brings in some additional value. And there are value propositions offered to students, units of study plus networking, there are also value propositions offered to employers. Information about students is given to employers who is good, who is not so good, and, and who has additional skills and things like that. So there are several values uh, that accrue in uh, at the, as outcomes. So this is the MOOC aggregator in the uh, MOOC becomes the aggregator in the value chain. Now let's see some rise in uh, technology enabled interactive platforms to promote learning process for students. There is a, there is a massive rise in uh, technology uh, based uh, platforms which are being used by institutions. Now that's all because the learning landscape is changing whether, uh, uh, whether COVID induced or whatever. Now uh, we, have, we are also all, already seeing individuals learn in airline queues in cafes and watching a new video tutorial in subways and buses, playing games or learning a new process. All this is already happening. And <clears throat> there is a great need for micro learning 
which means short, relevant, contextualized, personalized, value-wise. Now, these, this is a basic uh, core principle of developing content by any of the uh, players uh, in the market today. There's an explosion of growth in mobile learning, use of smartphones, mobile devices for consumption, and delivering interactive and emerging, engaging content of learning. Most of uh, this uh, is being developed for under the Android uh, uh, and mobile uh, learning uh, platforms. Uh, the rise of real world learning, learning is again, uh, there are different pedagogies uh, being developed uh, in, in terms of, in, in fact, in the, in the earlier days, if, you, uh, if we go back, we had a learning system which was based on friends, uh, you know, assisting uh, something like, uh, uh, you know, community learning, where I learn something, you learn something, someone else learning something, we all come together, exchange notes, and we, at the end of the day, we learn, we learn everything that the other fellow has learned. Now, this is typically pedagogy, and we also have, uh, today, people uh, going to the web, going to, you know, using several search algorithms that are available and so on. And therefore, we also talk about cyberbody. And in the future, we will have uh, students uh, who are very well directed. They know exactly what they want, where to search, how to search. And that part of the pedagogy is called utagogy. Now, therefore, all these uh, new uh, terms are being used increasingly to increase the collaboration and have a have a mechanism for social learning to engage employees to enable smarter decision making and business outcomes now again in the market today we have several best learning management systems and uh, this year these have been uh, the best of the learning management systems if universities are interested they actually go and uh, uh, do additional uh, uh, work on uh, one of these and uh, maybe implement them in their uh, universities. Uh, like I said, TalentMS, Moodle, Moodle is an open platform, iSpring, Edmodo, Joomla, LMS, Blackboard, Canvas, Litmus, these are all learning management systems that are available today. I made a comparison of some of them. Uh, most of these are 4, 4 and 4.5 uh, rating out of 5. They're all, uh, most of them are cloud host and open API is a talent MS. Again, Moodle is on-premise deployment. Then Edmodo, Blackboard and Schoology are cloud hosted. And on the right side, you will see the numbers actually work, number of students, users on, the, on these platforms. Now, uh, it's not enough uh, to uh, have a learning platform. Of course, it can also provide nothing like it. And we also need uh, the government of India has, we have a day courses which are interesting, but can be quite challenging. Coursera offers almost 4,000 courses which are from more than 200 universities and best of the professors uh, across the uh, globe. We have Khan Academy, Udemy, Canvas, FutureLearn, Today City, Open Education Europa. These are all the content, uh, content, uh, good content available on these uh, platforms. Uh, in addition to all these, you know, all this uh, fit and run, you also need a content management system which is a powerful, flexible editor. Uh, what you see is what you get, uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, idea that uh, works uh, in the editor. So to make sure you're making changes with the content management. Many times private authoring is there. For example, uh, in a, within a university, you may have good teachers who can create content and, and you may have a studio and do editing and so on and uh, create uh, content. Now that content reported on the uh, learning management system aligned with your ERP and so on. So you will need uh, content uh, management systems and also for, uh, you know, uh, student and faculty data analytics and, and so on. So therefore, some of the tools that are available are HubSpot, Squarespace, Wix, and WordPress. Now, uh, your IT team can figure out all, all these uh, interventions that are required in future. 
and the, the bottom line is that you'll need them at some point of time in, in not in very uh, distant future. Now, uh, there are many more long-term changes which are required. The entire education system, ecosystem will need to transform into a facility tourist paradigm, unlike the current faculty-centric uh, paradigms. Most of the things we decide today, tomorrow, that will not be the case, and the students will be much more, not, not so much uh, discerning as, uh, you know, the earlier days, much more uh, critical, and therefore, we will need student-centric systems. All And most of these platforms are, uh, you know, distributed systems. So therefore, there is nothing like uh, a teacher holding everything, and then uh, the students have to follow uh, the teacher. All the stakeholders will need to retrofit their expectations to the new realities emerging. But the transition from classroom teacher to guide to course mentor will not be easy. The faculty will have to change their uh, role within the classroom from a, a simply being a teacher, they'll have to become guides and they'll have to become course monitors because the content comes from somewhere else and you need to really interpret and uh, bring in the uh, best uh, aspects of the content in terms of learning experience from a student's uh, work if the education supply chain is not in sync with the market requirements. Today, the market is also changing for the requirement is important to be market uh, requirements. Now I'll take you quickly through what is the uh, requirement that I'm talking about. Here I have a slide, which is, which is actually the future of work. Now there are several underlying drivers. There are economic uh, structures, there are labor displacement there, and there is an emerging landscape. For example, the, you have connectivity, you have machine capabilities, you have demographics, you have social expectations. Now, when I talk about connectivity, I have information availability, I have a globalized access, I have a mobile net, network, uh, and, and so on. Most of the work also uh, gets done through a mobile and, and, and so on. So therefore, uh, you need uh, to understand the connectivity issues. You need to understand the economics behind that. You need to understand the labor displacement that is going to happen. No, lo the, no longer the pyramid-like structure for employment is true uh, today. The, bo the bottom of the pyramid is, uh, is large uh, in terms of uh, low-skilled uh, labor and so on in the earlier days. In the new paradigm, in, uh, in, in the uh, uh, industry 4.0 scenario, uh, the bottom of the pyramid came which means that you need high skill, higher skilled uh, people, labor, and it almost goes like a uh, pipeline structure where skills are required as you go up. So uh, this, this is all being necessity uh, because of the automation that is coming in, because of the artificial intelligence, intelligent agents that uh, take on most, most of the manual uh, jobs. So we need to understand this, this uh, slide much better uh, in, in order to uh, look at learning elements. Now, there is a rise in tech integrated courses designed to impart employability skills for the digital age. Now, there are several IT skills, uh, like for example, uh, the, the, when, I, when I say that hot skills, what it really means is these are the skills which are required to make a name or make a mark in the industry today. Without this, probably you are out. Whether you're a mechanical engineering person or a civil engineering person or whatever, the kind of mix that is happening within the industry, there's nothing like uh, a simple mechanical engineering device. There's nothing like a simple electronic device. It's, it's a combination of several technologies that come in. And therefore, a lot of hot skills which are required by almost every uh, applied science person or even a science graduate uh, today in order to fit into the market space that, that's available today. So people will need JavaScript, they need Java, Rust, Pandas, Java, full stack, Python, cybersecurity, blockchain, Docker, and containerization, edge computing, analytic skills, and so on within the IT sector. Within the business and IT skills, business and IT are so uh, in, uh, 
complementary to each other, one from the other. And enterprise asset management, customer care and billing, portal development, they are important. In, uh, in you know, ENC, you have project and portfolio in construction uh, area, infrastructure building, information modeling, planning, scheduling, emergency. In BFS, in financing sector, you need core banking, corporate lending, collateral management, retail. These are the skills which are required, whether you talk about upscaling or reskilling or in order to make anything, these are the skills required in addition to the, uh, to the basic uh, skill that you get within your graduate program. <laughs> in addition to all these domain export, export skills, you also need several other skills like complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others. Emotional intelligence is extremely important in order to behave with people. There's, like I said, there is nothing like uh, you know, centralized working anymore. Uh, even within the uh, factories uh, that we have today or universities of the future, uh, we have distributed learning and therefore we, we have to intermingle with several people and emotional intelligence comes into play. Judgment, decision making, service orientation, negotiation, cognitive flexibility. You must be able to fit into several different situations and uh, without needing extra uh, training uh, for that uh, purpose. So the cognitive flexibility is extremely important. Now, this is an essential skills map for digital transformation. I have marked for engineering, for data science, for product, for finance, for marketing, and for managers on one side, and the business skills, the technical skills, the data skills on the other. Now, this uh, also will tell you where to, what kind of skills are required if you fit into a certain uh, industrial environment or certain uh, industry that you want to join in terms of and so on. Employment skills that are in the current context. Uh, I can't possibly go through every one of them because of positive. So these are the future jobs versus the new skills that we uh, require. There are new opportunities for 10,000. And there is a growth which is uh, happening uh, in the real world. So you need fintech, you need data and AI, uh, engineering, cloud computing, sales, marketing, product, people culture. And one which is fast growing is the healthcare economy. There are low school skills of like I said, the entry level jobs are shrinking. So the low skill jobs jobs are all hit hardest by COVID-19. And uh, that's because more, a lot of automation is uh, being introduced uh, because of these uh, people not able to come together or the social distancing that is required and so on. These are the areas and how it actually impacts the uh, different, uh, different sectors in terms of low skilled jobs. For example, accommodation and food service is the hardest hit. Retail trade will be hit. Construction will be hit, be hit, government service will be hit, and so on. Then, uh, in order to get students, uh, you need that you need uh, some undergraduate program. Then you need some uh, additional value added, added courses. The central portion shows, and uh, you need uh, uh, skill sets for job and career uh, success. So you can join different places and get uh, uh, words on the job skills. And then if one is interested in uh, higher studies, they can always do it. The, uh, yeah. Now, uh, looking at 4.0 very briefly, uh, let's look at uh, what is this in, uh, 2020 Internet Minute. If I look at uh, the Facebook, I have 1.3 million logins every single minute. I have one, 19 million texts which are sent every single minute. There are, uh, f uh, you know, 694, uh, you know, 6,94,000 scrolling Instagrams and so on. 190 million emails are sent and 1,400 TikTok downloads are done. This is the kind of, uh, you know, pace at which the world is moving and the business is getting done. So we have so many uh, uh, billion urbanization, you have, uh, you know, unique mobile users, you have internet users, active social media users, 
or shall we use it? So the eco space is turning digital, and therefore we need to really look at what is required. Uh, the full integration of information and communication technology and automation technology in the factories of the future is, is the definition by KPMG for industry 4.0. And we are actually talking of four factories of the future. Very, in very simple terms, what it means is today, man talks to man. Uh, man. Your, uh, you know, the uh, mnemonics and uh, the uh, assembly language uh, uh, requirements have uh, made us in some limited fashion to talk to machines and in future we will have machines talking to machines and that is industry 4.0 so therefore a lot of automation comes in which can make certain jobs redundant certain retraining will be required certain reskilling will be required certain upskilling will be required otherwise one will be out of job now, IoT, the Internet of Things and Internet of People. In, there are several communicating devices in this world and there are several people using them. So if any communicating device, uh, for example, you have a mobile, you have uh, a camera, you have uh, any, any, any other, day, maybe your pen drive and things like that. These are all communicating devices, your PC and so on. So there are billions of communicating, communicating devices all over the world and they all talk to each other over a single protocol and there are people who are connected and therefore this whole technology is bringing a uh, nice blend between internet of things and internet of people in the digitized economy and if you look at the top there is internet of things and at the bottom you have product innovation process innovation autonomous agents digital networking and what fills the space between this is labor 4.0 or the skills that are required fit the industry 4.0. So you need digital services, you need, there are several smart products, there are smart factories. In order to man them, you need labor who understands that. Therefore, labor 4.0 skills are required. As a part of the complete value chain is disturbed because of the uh, industrialization that we are looking at. So the global communication infrastructure, the supply man chain management, the asset management, the sensors, actually anything that you talk about is being uh, in terms of the value proposition or the technology that is coming in. Uh, I have slowly moved out from the, uh, from the uh, uh, perspectives of online education into Industry 4.0 because these two come and meet together in order to, for the student to build the kind of skills that are required in, in future. And uh, for example, here I have four products which, which you will understand how the technology is moving. I have a Philips lighting, which uh, we, through the mobile you can cont control the hue. Uh, there is a Medtronic's implanted digital blood glucose meter, which connects and finds it. You know, Ralph Lauren is a, is a shirt which uh, works like a smartwatch, and Babylot is something that can track the ball movement and the speed at which it moves and things like that. Now, uh, we need, uh, we need uh, skills which can actually operate these kind of smart systems. Therefore, there are a lot of uh, technologies which are uh, making this happen. One is artificial intelligence, uh, you know, AI, AR, augmented uh, reality, virtual reality, uh, internet of things, and, and so on. So therefore, now, a rise in blended learning environment also becomes very, very uh, needed in order to learn about many of these, uh, uh, many of these uh, technologies. <clears throat> now, personalized uh, learning is something that I've already talked about. AI and algorithms, AI algorithms can empower students and result in uh, for example, AI uh, and data analytics can tell you exactly what is the level of the student and uh, where he's lagging or where he's fast, things like that. Such analytics is, will be available through the learning management systems. And therefore, the learning can be uh, on, online, can be uh, made some personal uh, to a, a student. Uh, there is a lot of automation in education, like for example, AI algorithms in uh, the education sector, they reduce administrative load on educators using the technology for repetitive tasks, faster assessment of projects and assignments. 
institutions when they have uh, you know facilities and uh, they are presented a visual stimulating environment that makes learning more immersive uh, and there are there are several ar vr devices available today that the oculus technologies which are available and using this technology students can get immersive and experience uh, experiential learning outside the classroom like i said gamification is another method uh, that's highly successful in creating immersive environments uh, we uh, we are actually moving to smart learning uh, environments interactive applications devices they all help you uh, big data machine learning wearable devices they all help you in uh, learning better uh, we also need to leverage best in breed technology to create a thriving academic atmosphere for students now in a in a university there are typical problems like for example i have some erp of somebody uh, some company i have learning management system of someone else and i have multiple uh, players uh, you know supporting different uh, software and different applications and so on so therefore how do i integrate them do i need so many teams and so, so all all those kind of problems uh, in the end they uh, reduce the interactivity and the learning uh, you know system that you create from a student's perspective <coughs> so therefore enterprises often purchase software from different vendors and you need something to integrate all this so best of breed is a uh, you know vendors often numerous enterprise applications and claim that the integrated system is a superior solution so you will have to find out which one is the best in the market and try and figure out and uh, try building the other systems on over <coughs> over the uh, best of breed system then you also need managed service providers so who can deliver services such as network application infrastructure security uh via ongoing and regular support and active administration and so on now these are all the operating part of the uh, technology uh there is obviously uh, these things have uh, you know uh, a uh, a certain uh, influence on the way we teach uh, like i said uh, Uh, we create immersive learning experience through ar vr we create gamification of learning smart learning and so on uh, the certainly the learning landscape is changing Individual, individuals uh, they learn and uh, you know at different places and and so on uh, so on now having said all that we have what are these universities of the future for example Uh, yeah, what i am suggesting here is the universities must transform uh, slowly but consciously to something that must be uh, possible uh, to be uh, you know sustained in future and replicated in future we also need change of organizational structures which we, which means we need change of business model in operation and industry concepts for faculties departments and so on no way you can have silos of departments they are active there is nothing like the top driven and, and so on everything is distributed and so on. like i said the accreditation procedure must undergo change quality assistance to role for examination of this so most of the for the online examinations proctor and so on. no fixed degree programs like for example students will be uh, interested in for go to a fixed degree like a ba or bsc or courses together programs together to create their uh, learning experience change of uh, teaching methods uh, you know new teaching concepts new teaching infrastructure digital rights management all this becomes important uh, there are the acceleration in it. for example if a student uh, is capable of completing a btech of a four year program in three years <coughs> that must be allowed to happen it, and that will be allowed to happen in future and there are changing change of methodologies massive today what is happening is a massive uh, 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 
a piston in some other country, the engine body in some other country, and bring all of them to uh, another country and assemble them. All this is possible because of the, uh, you know, uh, the technology uh, intensive systems that we have uh, today. In fact, most of the automobile manufacturers are already doing all those uh, things that I'm talking about. So you have uh, targeted specialized courses, your customer built certificate, diploma, degree programs, learning, complete online assessment, and quality assurance, which is extremely important. So this, this is basically the future, the future of universities, the virtual universities, and uh, the kind of information that you require in order to make these things happen. Some of the slides, the, this, these are the references that I've used you know, to create some of the slides that I, that you have seen. And uh, like uh, all that I can say is that the pandemic uh, road ahead, we'll have to uh, choose and we'll have to figure out uh, where we want to go. The industry 4.0 skills are extremely important. Labor 4.0 skills. Management platforms make that happen. So therefore, a university must subscribe must have all these uh, things and they must consciously look at uh, transforming the current uh, set of uh, boundary conditions to fit into a future requirement of uh, a future university and a virtual one at that. So, so as a university, you could uh, look at what you have today, stock taking, current semester, what, what you have done and what uh, you need to do. Uh, look at what kind of learning management systems you have, content platforms you have, virtual labs, whether you have subscribed to them, content management uh, system, future learning, delivery models, have you deliberated on this? In uh, going into the near, next semester, what do you want to do? The pandemic doesn't look like going away anywhere, uh, at least for the next six months. So therefore, you will really need to understand the the uh, dynamics within the dynamics outside the classroom. Figure out how you will reach uh, everyone who has to be reached. And you'll also have to figure out how the research will be done in uh, times of social distancing and so on. And of course, you will have to create entrepreneurship cells. You will have to connect with the industry. Startup ecosystems will have to be subscribed to and eventually transform. The university. This is the call to action for you. Uh, I'll end this uh, by saying a well-educated mind always have more questions, will always have more questions than answers. This is Helen Keller. We all know uh, <clears throat> the passion with which she worked and uh, spoke. Now this is where you can reach me and that's, that's about it. So what I'll do is I'll uh, stop sharing and come back. Thank yes. you so much. Th thank you, sir. Uh, like there are many questions actually, but uh, like you know, few questions we had uh, taken up. I would like to request Dr. H. Barbuya, our academic registrar of University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, to kindly uh, like you know ask a few questions from the participants. Sure. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we have compiled uh, several questions from the participants, and I'll, on their behalf, I'll try to put few questions for their understanding. Yeah. So one question goes like this: Is it possible to bring the poorest strata of the students studying in the rural institutes yeah. into the e-learning coverage? Yeah. If possible, what kind of quality can be expected in the long run? No, that's, that's a very important uh, question. People are already talking about uh, the insufficient bandwidths and, uh, you know, people in rural places not able to, you know, forget about internet. They also have problems of power supplies and, and things like that. So, therefore, uh, yes. what uh, really needs to be uh, done is uh, uh, one needs to use the cable uh, network. Uh, much more uh, than what uh, people are using it uh, today, for, uh, today. The content is available. What one can do is uh, uh, tie up with uh, the cable uh, network, maybe at the government level, and uh, give a three-hour slot or a four-hour slot, assuming that most of the houses will have uh, uh, some kind of uh, pain to uh, you know, receive, those, uh, uh, receive that content. So, uh, 
that's that's one alternative the second alternative is there are small handheld uh, devices which are explicitly designed to carry uh, content and uh, which have limited features in terms of in terms of receiving content and uh, displaying content and also uh, doing some kind of uh, chatting they could cost maybe 5000 rupees or whatever and the government will need to create hotspots at different uh, in rural places provide these devices to uh, people who cannot afford that and that's another way of uh, reaching uh, the students the third way of doing that is the government already has announced 100 uh, uh, you know uh, channels for uh, for promoting uh, the education but like I said, every situation will call for uh, some amount of, uh, you know, uh, some amount of uh, in innovation into the way we, we are doing things. And therefore, uh, yes, I mean, there will be certainly a difficulty as far as the uh, rural population is concerned. But these are not, in fact, a, a cable has reached almost every single uh, village with uh, BSNL uh, doing the uh, job. Uh, so therefore, all that you need is the last mile connectivity, even, even in a remote uh, place. So if that is uh, done, uh, if that is taken up uh, uh, by the governments, local governments, then all these uh, issues can be sorted out. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So there is one more question. Uh, in 7030 model, there will be a question of uh, coverage of the syllabus for practical courses. Can you advise me? No, I, I don't think there will be any problem of that kind. What I meant by 7030 is uh, uh, you have uh, some, see, uh, every semester has uh, almost six, uh, five to six courses typically yes. uh, so you need to figure out uh, not every one of them uh, will need a lab work and things like that so you can uh, look at uh, some of the courses going online and yes. uh, substituting that uh, uh, part of uh, you know curriculum uh, yes. so therefore uh, that part becomes 20 30 percent uh, of the uh, learning that I'm talking about. The remaining 70% obviously would require some lab work or some, uh, you know, uh, hand-holding the, the competency-based uh, skills to be built and, and so on. So therefore, some amount of uh, actual hand, hand working will be required. So that okay. content will be about 70%. And uh, this 30% will be actually the online or the, or the value addition that you can do to a student. Okay, sir. okay, so if time permits, there is one more question. Whether we, will, we can take this last ICT question. Okay, okay. So whether our ICT infrastructures are adequate to meet the challenges of the day? No, I don't. I can't uh, really answer that uh, directly because one will have to make an assessment of what is uh, there and uh, and so on. So uh, in short, if you if you if you have a good uh, learning management system available with you yes and yes. if you subscribe to a good uh, content uh, provider like uh, maybe Dex or Coursera or and so on similar uh, then uh, yes a lot of some content is also available on Swayam of a government uh, platform so you can use uh, these first you'll have to make an assessment of what courses you want to ship on online and um, uh, and that assessment, you'll have to figure out which, which, whose content is uh, good to, you know, uh, retrofit. And uh, having done all that, you you will be certainly in a position to make an assessment of whether it whether it will work or, or not. But uh, uh, the bottom line is, you'll have to make it work. If you do not have certain uh, facilities, you'll have to create them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank you so I think, sir, uh, we like you know with the time constraint, uh, like we will be uh, like we have a lot of questions. Even now, the questions are coming, but uh, we hope that you know we can uh, ask uh, Mantha, sir, uh, to kindly like you know we will be sending the questions. If he can answer it uh, on like you know by email, we can share oh, it to the participant. Uh, sir, yeah. now I would yeah. like to request uh, Dr. H. Barbuya, our academic register, to kindly present the vote of thanks, mm -hmm. Dr. Barbuya. Good up. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, one and all joined in the live webinar today. Honorable former chairman AICT and distinguished speaker of today's live webinar, Professor S.S. Mantasar, 
Honorable Chancellor, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, Shri Mehbubul Haq sir. Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, Professor Suhail Sabhi sir. My colleagues and our IT officers engaged in hosting the event. It's an honor for me to offer the vote of thanks in this August session today. First of all, uh, my heartiest gratitude to Professor Mantha sir for the wonderful session and sharing the new knowledge with all of us, which is the most precious thing in life. It's indeed a privilege for us to listen to one of the most distinguished personalities in the academic sphere. So your valuable inputs and suggestions will form the basis in framing the institutional strategies towards promoting quality in higher educational institutions in the present and post pandemic situation. Thank you once again, sir, for taking the technical education of our country, country to much greater heights under your able leadership as chairman of AICT during your tenure. We'd like to have you again in such live session. Thank you, sir. Our sincere thanks and gratitude to our Honorable Chancellor and University of Science and Technology Halepi Mehrabh for his visionary leadership. Today's live webinar is the brainchild of our Honorable Chancellor. With his inspiration and support, our university and the Engineering College Regional Institute of, Institute of Science and Technology were in the forefront to conduct the online classes ever since the lockdown was announced and also putting in place all the health safety measures in our campuses, including the technological tools to carry on the effective teaching learning processes in such challenging situation. We look forward to his continued guidance and support. Our sincere thanks and gratitude to our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Suhail Sabir sir, for the much needed guidance and support organizing this webinar. I thank our registrar, Mr. Sanju Hazarika, Dr. Alpana Choudhury, Director of Student Affairs, Mrs. Polly Buragohai, OSD, and all other colleagues for their exceptional support. We convey our sincere thanks and gratitude to the esteemed participants for their overwhelming response and wholehearted participation, which has made this webinar so meaningful and truly significant. We look forward to your inputs and continuous association towards making strategies to face similar challenges in future in the field of higher education. I thank Ms. Mehzabin Rahman for putting together the entire live webinar so well. I thank our IT officers for their support in conducting the webinar of this magnitude so, so smoothly. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank thank you, you so much, Dr. Uh, Ajmal Barbhaniya. Sir, we are indeed honored that, you know, Mantha sir has given such a wonderful uh, session today and we hope that, you know, sir, next time we will hear you in the university. Uh, we hope everything comes to normal and we, we, we would really look forward to receiving you in the UI, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya. And I would like to request all the participants to kindly fill up their participant uh, feedback form. And also we have the fourth lecture coming up on the 20th of June. Uh, Professor Sir Sanjay Deshmukh, former Vice Chancellor of University of Mumbai, shall be speaking on the session. So we will see you on the 20th. Thank you so much. Mantha sir, from the deep, uh, like thank you. the of our heart, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It will be my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.